Beginning in winter 1837, a year of rebellion erupted across Upper and Lower Canada. Settlers, who were unsatisfied with the British government of the provinces, rose up to demand responsible government. In Upper Canada, which is currently the southern half of Ontario, this rebellion was led by William Lyon Mackenzie, a Scottish-born journalist and reform politician. At noon on December 5, 1837, he marched down Young Street with his rebel forces. In Norwich Township, the Troubles were connected directly to the division of land throughout the township. The settlers felt that they were being left to open up tracts of land owned by non-residents, often the Church of England, and disrupting their settlement. Despite their pacifist beliefs, several of the Quakers of Norwich allied themselves to this cause. Two days after Mackenzie's march, word reached Norwich Township Representative Dr. Charles Duncan. Duncan had allied himself with the reformers and held widespread support throughout the township because of his actions in Parliament in favour of school reform and temperance. In 1836, he had carried a petition to the British government in London, England, complaining of electoral malfeasance on the part of the Tory government of Upper Canada but the colonial office had refused to see him. Before he made it back to Canada, his 14-year-old son was killed. Duncan was increasingly disillusioned with British rule as a result. So, when Duncan heard of Mackenzie's march on the 8th of December, 1837, three days after it began, he headed to Norwich. Over the next few days, he gathered about 200 Norwich men and marched towards Toronto on 12th of December. Unfortunately, by this time Mackenzie's rebellion had already been dispersed, with the leaders fleeing to the United States. Duncombe and his allies made it as far as Scotland, their numbers swelling to 450, but they were soon dispersed and returned to Norwich in a shamble. Many fled the country, including Duncombe. Tensions ran high throughout 1838. Mackenzie continued to make raids against Upper Canada from across the US border. The village of Norwich was occupied by the Oxford militia twice. One Norwich resident, Daniel Bedford, was executed after he took part in the raid at Windsor. Today I'm going to explore the rebellion of 1837 through some objects in the Norwich Museum. The build-up to the rebellion in Norwich was largely based in land. Inadequate surveying of the land in Norwich Township led to disputes over boundaries, scant lots, and leftover triangles or gores. In 1819, Norwich co-founder Peter Lossing wrote to the Lieutenant Governor, Residents labour under great inconveniences on account of their being necessitated to open roads through large tracts of land intersected by swamps, creeks, and marshes owned by non-residents who do not appear inclined to sell nor settle their land. They leave it in uncultivated waste, a harbour of beasts of prey to rise in value by enterprise and industry of others whom necessity compels to open roads at heavy expense, many miles from home through these lands. In the 1830s, John Tidy, a man in his late 30s from Berkshire, England, and the former owner of this land, was hired to come to Norwich to resurvey the land. Dr. Charles Duncombe headed a parliamentary review in which Tidy's reassessment was accepted. However, this did nothing to quell the unrest in Norwich. Throughout the summer of 1837, some settlers were still disrupting road construction and tearing up surveyor stakes. This general unrest played well into the themes of Mackenzie's Reform Party which saw them as rooted in the corrupt family compact, which controlled important political posts and appointments in the province. Tidy became a central part of the unrest in Norwich in 1837. At a meeting in September 1837, held in the inn owned by Daniel Bedford, he was elected president of the Norwich Political Union, a group organised to ensure that the reformers in Norwich acted in accordance with the reformers throughout the province. With Peter DeLong, one of the co-founders of the township, he was appointed a delegate of the Union. These clandestine meetings continue to be held throughout the fall in townships with strong support for the Reform Party, as illustrated here. When the uprising in Toronto occurred that December, 
John Tidy was one of the rebels who met with Charles Duncombe when he reached Norwich. Duncombe told Tidy that there was a warrant out for Tidy's arrest. The government, Duncombe said, was trying to install terror in the reformers by issuing these warrants of arrest. Duncombe appointed Tidy his secretary in the rebel movement, and when Tidy was arrested the following year, it was said that he was aware of all the secrets of the rebellion. Despite this involvement in the many meetings leading up to the March on Scotland, Tidy himself does not appear to have been part of Duncombe's so-called army. Tidy was jailed in London on February 7th, 1838, where he remained over that summer, even after the trial and acquittal of other Norwich rebels. The Solicitor General, William Draper, described Tidy as the worst of the whole of the prisoners in the London jail, and as too contemptible to make his execution of value as a further example. He was officially pardoned on August 30th, 1838, but not released until after November that year. On the 14th of December, 1837, Colonel Alan McNabb led a troop of around 800 men to Scotland. While most of Duncombe's forces had already fled, he was met by three Norwich men, Solomon Lossing, Peter Sackrider, and William Cromwell, who asked that those who had taken up arms might be forgiven. Solomon Lossing later claimed that McNabb had promised that he would do all he could to ensure that the authorities would take no action, on which assurance Lossing persuaded many of the rebels to give themselves up. McNabb, meanwhile, received more reinforcements, and with over 1,000 men he headed to Norwich town. When he arrived, he was disappointed to learn that the leaders of the rebellion, including Duncan, had long since fled. Nevertheless, he set up militia locations in Burgessville, Norwich, and Otterville to hunt for more rebels. Stories of the militia's harassment in Norwich abound. This bayonet, which would have been attached to the barrel of a rifle, is said to have been one of the weapons used to threaten the people of Norwich. McNabb gathered 200 residents in the town square to lecture them and to publicly arrest Solomon Lossing, who, as Justice of the Peace, should have reported treasonous meetings to the authorities. With this, he hoped to scare more rebels into compliance. With a thousand men, there were also problems billeting them in the town, contributing to the harassment. Thirteen militiamen entered the house of Sarah and Caleb Tompkins at breakfast time, demanding food at once. Sarah Tompkins said that they would wait or get nothing, at which a militiaman threatened to kick her, while another threatened to shoot her. On the other hand, some township residents resisted. When Margaret Murphy, an employee of the rebel suspect David Hagerman, heard that the militia were coming to search her absent employer's house, she stood in the doorway with a pitchfork in one hand and two pistols at her belt daring them to touch anything. The occupation did nothing to quell sympathy for the rebellion in Norwich. In fact, it may have done the opposite. After he was acquitted of high treason in April 1838, Solomon Lossing organized a petition to the government from members of the township to complain about the conduct of the militia. The result was a report by the magistrates of the London district completely exonerating the militiamen. In late June 1838, while John Tidy was in prison, Lieutenant Colonel William Breedley of the Oxford Militia gathered a body of men to occupy the town of Norwich once more. Following a number of further incidents in the township in the months after the march, he was convinced that the rebels there were receiving arms and ammunition from the United States. There was only one problem for the militia. They did not have enough arms and ammunition of their own, nor did they have enough volunteers to help them with their mission. Morale was low, they had already searched for the rebels in winter and been unsuccessful. The militia once again trapped through Norwich, seizing firearms, overrunning homes and demanding meals and accommodation. Many more men were arrested this time. While loyalists to the government seemed to have been in constant fear of the rebels, those who were not loyalists, reformists or otherwise, seemed to have become convinced that the militia would use any excuse to harass them. In the fall and winter of 1838, 
Mackenzie continued to lead raids into Canada from the United States. In early December, a group of about 150 rebels boarded the steamer Chaplin on the Detroit River and launched a raid on Windsor. The rebels burned a Canadian boat and guardhouse and killed several loyalists. When the local militia arrived, they killed more than 20 rebels, with more dying from the cold as they tried to escape. The militia also captured 40 rebels, among whom was the Norwich innkeeper Daniel Bedford. Daniel Bedford had been involved in the original march to Scotland in 1837, and had given himself up to the authorities on the 17th of December that year, alongside his older brother, Paul. Daniel eventually gained his freedom in June 1838 by denouncing Charles Duncan and expressing regret for his actions. And yet, he joined the Winds of Raid. He was tried in London. While the majority of his fellow conspirators had their death sentences commuted to hard labor in the penal colonies, Bedford was hanged on 11th of January, 1839. Five other men were also executed before the decision was made to commute the sentences of those involved in the raid. Bedford was buried in the Pioneer Cemetery on Quaker Street in Norwich, where his grave can still be seen today. Between two and three hundred people attended his funeral, attesting to the support for the rebels in the township. He was survived by his wife and their four children, all under the age of eight. Paul Bedford had never been released after the initial raid. After being sentenced to 14 years of hard labor in the British penal colony in Tasmania, he and several other prisoners had been transported to England in the winter of 1838. On the day his brother was executed, Paul was awaiting trial in Newgate Prison, London, England, to determine whether the convictions in Canada should stand. Norwich residents, including John Tidy, continued writing petitions in support of the men, and it was eventually ruled that the legal proceedings in Canada were mishandled and that the rebels should be freed, providing they did not return to Canada. Well, from the perspective of Mackenzie and Duncan, the rebellion was probably an utter disaster. It does appear to have resulted in some reform in the governments of Canada over the following years. In Norwich Township, being a rebel seemed to have ultimately had quite a few advantages. John Tidy went back to his job as a land surveyor, laying out land divisions in Norwich and Otterville. He later became a teacher and was ultimately superintendent of Oxford schools. Paul Bedford, forbidden from returning to Canada, went first to Michigan in the United States, but later returned to Norwich Township in 1842, and 15 years later, in 1857, he was elected Reeve. Other rebels and supposed rebels went on to play a significant role in the local politics of Norwich. Solomon Lossing, who was the local justice of the peace at the time of the rebellion, became district councillor in 1842 and was warden in 1843. If you'd like to learn more about the Rebellion of 1837 and the role Norwich residents played in these events, there are several books available from Norwich Museum and Oxford County Libraries. Hotbed of Treason by David Brearley was extremely useful in writing this presentation. When the museum is open, you can also arrange to see our display on the Rebellion, which is here, and you can listen to our audio tour on SoundCloud at any time. Thank you.